Let's see if I... Oh, come on. Why is it not letting me do this? Okay, so... Now... Oh my goodness, I have to start with a new page. A new page! Wow. Technical difficulties. Okay, so the last part of the chapter that you guys read about were periodic trends. And periodic trends include various things like um, ionization energy, which we mentioned, of course, in the context of photoemission spectroscopy, um, the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from a gaseous atom. It could be things like um, atomic size or atomic radius. could be different things like electronegativity. And when we talk about periodic trends, and those aren't, aren't all of them, but when we talk about periodic trends, we're talking about things like with ionization energy, as you go down a group, what happens on the periodic table to ionization energy? As you go down a group, does it require more energy or less energy to remove an electron? Less. So it decreases as you go down a group. As you go across a period, does ionization energy increase or decrease? It increases. And while knowing the trend itself could be helpful, you are never going to use the fact that you have memorized, if you have, um, a trend to help explain things. What you have to be able to do is to say ionization energy decreases down a group and here's why. And you have to be very careful about how you explain that. And so one of the things that's going to help us to explain some of these periodic trends is Coulomb's law, which many of you have learned in physics. Now it's not the only thing that we're going to use to describe periodic trends. There are other things that we might find helpful in explaining perhaps why ionization energy increases or decreases. Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, we may consider in explaining some of these the fact that, you know, maybe the number of energy levels changes. That might be a reason why, you know, something increases or decreases down a trend or down a group. Maybe we're, we could talk about the repulsion of electrons. That might help explain some observations we make in the atoms, especially if we look at it in terms of the orbital diagram. We might want to take a look at, say, proton-electron ratios. Or we may want to take a look at something we'll mention later, effective nuclear charge. These are all ways that we can help explain, not all of them at the same time necessarily, but why ionization energy does what it does or why we find the size of atoms increasing as you go down a group or decreasing as you go across a period. We have to have some tools in our toolbox to be able to explain those things. And a big tool then is Coulomb's Law. So how many of you have learned Coulomb's Law? Two of you, three of you, the rest of you not? Are you in physics now? Or you refuse to raise your hand? Okay, see, more of you have who care to admit. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to talk about Coulomb's Law. You guys talked about Coulomb's Law and physics, I don't know, with just charged particles or magnets or particles mostly. Okay, we're going to talk about Coulomb's Law in light of looking at the attractive force of an electron, like its attraction to the nucleus. Electrons don't fly off into space because they're attracted to the nucleus. There's a force of attraction. So Coulomb's law is essentially, we're going to call it F sub E, and this particular thing is going to refer, we're going to refer to this as the attractive or repulsive, depending on what we are putting the electron by, force on an electron. And that attractive force is going to be equal to a constant times Q1 times Q2 over D squared. 
Now the constant I'll give you in a moment, but Q1 and Q2 refer to the charges on the particles that you're talking about. What's D? It's distance, and when we're talking about an atom, the distance that we're referring to when we're talking about, for example, an outer electron and the nucleus is going to be our atomic radius because that would give us the distance between the outer electron and the nucleus, which is where it's being attracted to. So for this force of attraction here, if we find that F sub E gives you a negative number when you compute it, what that means is you're talking about an attractive force. So when you're comparing an electron to a proton, your F sub E should turn out to be negative. If your F sub E turns out to be a positive number, then that means that we're talking about a repulsive force, one electron to another. Or if you were comparing two protons, for example, together, we would expect to get a positive number. Now this K, in the case of, of, of this, K is this value, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. Newton's meter squared per coulomb squared. Matthew? Uh, do we have to memorize all these constants? You don't. I will give you the constants. So you don't have to memorize, but you should be able to use the constants. So you don't have to memorize them. Okay, physics people, what's a Newton? Okay, yes, it's a unit of force required to, to do what? One kilogram of mass. Good, one meter per second squared. Awesome. See, Mr. Williams, we do physics in here. You got that right. I do chemistry in mine, too. So. Love it. It's like they are intermingled. Mm -hmm. Right, Neil? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What's a coulomb? It's a unit of charge. All right, so this is some background, because I know some of you are in physics right now. If you're in physics now, have you covered this stuff? Okay, well, good. You'll learn it here first. Awesome. So, a unit of charge. So, to give you an idea, if we're talking about an electron, we can literally measure the charge of an electron in coulombs. That's how we measure the charge. And so, for an electron, it's, it, the amount of charge on one electron is negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And it's a negative number because it's negatively charged. If you're talking about a proton, that's equal and opposite in charge. So it's positive 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So this is some background information. We're going to try to put it together into a problem to have it make some sense to us. But before we put it in the problem, I want us to take a look at the equation itself. So if we focus on this equation, Obviously, the constant doesn't change. I could put that water bottle away. You guys are like <laughs> enthralled by this water bottle. It's so weird. What happens to the force on the electron if you increase the distance? It is squared, but if you increase the distance, this gets bigger, what happens to our, our force? It gets smaller, right? If you increase the charges, what happens to your, your force? It gets bigger. Now, some of you, like in Chem 1, may have seen this, not necessarily computing Coulomb's law, but if you think about an ionic compound that's composed of something with, say, a plus 3 ion and a minus 2 ion, those are bigger charges than if it's a plus 1 minus 1 ion and that's going to increase the force of attraction. So while this is you know, useful for our electron and that's where our, the context of what we're using it, um, certainly Coulomb's law, as you found in physics or will find in physics, has applications other than just electron to proton. Trevor? So it does work for atoms. It does. It works for anything that you're really looking at that have either the same or opposing charges. Well, if it's an ion, you're looking at the particles themselves. So you would be looking like between the positive ion, you know, sodium, it's plus one, and it's what it's combining to, say, sulfur, which is minus two. So you'd be looking at the attraction from the one sodium to a sulfur. 
we're not using that in this context, but yes, it absolutely is applicable there. Okay, so let's look at an example problem then. So here's an example problem. What is the electron attractive force F sub E for a valence electron in the carbon atom? And a piece of information that we need to know is the atomic radius. So the atomic radius, or our distance, is 77.2 picometers. Anyone know how many picometers are in a meter? 10 to the 12th. There's 10 to the 12th picometers is equal to a meter. So, or we could change this. It was 77.2, so we can make it 7.72 times 10 to the minus. 11 meters, because that was already by a power of 10. That doesn't look like 11. It's too close. Oh, great. I got my eraser, and now I can't get my pen back. Oh, come on. <laughs> what is happening on my screen? Okay, there we go. Okay, ignore the fact that the rest of that just... Oh, you know, disappeared. Oh, I'm going to have to put <laughs> attractive force. Okay, so here's, here's the question then. We're going to plug this in. In order to find that, we're going to use Coulomb's law. So the force of attractive on an electron is K times Q1 times Q2 divided by D squared, and we can plug in the numbers that we have. So K is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th Newton's meters squared per coulomb squared. Last period, I totally wrote my units down wrong. Totally screwed everything up. I had to redo the video for it. It's embarrassing. Anyway, so that is K per coulomb squared. Um, here's the thing. We're talking about a valence electron in the carbon atom. So before I kind of continue this, carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So what we're really talking about in the carbon atom is, you know, here's the nucleus, here's the 1s with got two electrons, here's the 2s with two electrons. Um, 2p2, how many p orbitals have electrons in them? Two. So I'm going to draw two p orbitals. So what we're talking about is an electron that's in our valence electron, so one of the p's is what we're probably trying to yank off. That one electron is being attracted by how many protons in my nucleus? No? Six. Carbon is atomic number six. So in that nucleus, there are six protons. That's important as we start to continue this calculation. So Q1 and Q2, I don't care which one you decide is the positive or negative. It makes no difference. So I'm going to make Q1 the positive. I have one electron, and it has a charge of negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. My Q2 then are the positive. Well, I have six protons. All six are attracting that electron times the charge of that, which is positive 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then I can divide it by my distance squared, which I'm going to use the meter version because my constant was in meters, so 7.72 times 10 to the minus 11 meters squared. Monica, do you have a question? Well, I'm trying to actually just try to compute the electron attractive force for one valence electron. Um, otherwise, it becomes a little difficult. Like if I was trying to find the electron attractive force for one of the electrons in the 1s orbital of carbon, it's not as far out. So its distance would be different. So I would have to compute that separately. So it's better to kind of do one electron at a time. But I look at all six of the protons, because those are in like a pinpoint spot, and they are all attracting. The fact that there's six is going to have a greater attractive force than if I only had two protons in there. So then all of the, um, so all of the electrons have the same um, energy level have the same energy. 
essentially. I mean, it, it's certainly an average, and it, it may depend as the electron moves, but on average, yes, within within that same distance. Zena? Are you just confused on how you found the triplets? These numbers? Yeah. Because I gave them to you. No, not those. I mean, they're oh. in one and Oh, so the one is because I am literally talking about one electron, this guy, but it is being attracted by the nucleus, which contains six protons, and that's where the six comes from. So there's six protons in the nucleus, and all six of them are going to have a role in attracting any one of the electrons that carbon has. We're going to simply focus on one of the outer electrons. Okay. Think about that. Drew? Is this a question on like atomic radius? Like, where exactly is like, the end of the radius? Well, it's a good question because we don't know for sure because there's not like a defined hard outline to that. Typically, they look at where the electron, the furthest out the electron goes about 90% of the time, much like they would look at those orbitals, which represent 90% of the time where an electron would be found in a region in space. It's the same idea. So they're going to look at that kind of outer edge where the electrons are 90% of the time inside of that edge. Is this a clearly defined, someone took out a ruler and measured it distance? No, part of this is, is sort of a measured slash calculated distance based on what they know because they're kind of tiny to measure those little tiny distances. AJ? So for the Coulomb's law, like the numbers here, you always put one of them like an atomic number, like for example, the six. If you're five. talking about a proton attracting an electron, yes. Now, if we're talking about two electrons attract, if they're, they'll obviously be repulsed from each other, we may just have one and one. One electron, another electron. So it depends what you're trying to compute it for. In this problem, I'm trying to compute one electron being attracted to the nucleus and carbon, which contains six protons. Neil? If you're in an excited state, certainly that, if you think about Coulomb's law just in general, if that electron suddenly absorbs energy and now its distance has increased here, right, what's going to happen to its force of electron in that excited state? It's going to be lower. Um, so yeah, if, if that electron is in an excited state, that whatever we compute here is not going to be what its force of electron would be at that moment. Would the radius be affected? They wouldn't measure it as, as a different radius just because you excited an electron. Because again, the electron probably isn't going to stay in any given atom. It's going to drop back down. And since it's a 90% of the time the electrons fall inside of a spot, if it just jumps up for a, a moment in time, it's not going to increase that so radius. Right. Okay, so this number here, you end up, I computed it, ne negative 2 point, not 2.2, 2.32, and there we go, i got to stop changing pens, times 10 to the minus 7 newtons. So that is the force of attraction on that electron in carbon for that. Now let me ask you a question. Which one is going to affect the force of attraction more? Is it going to be a change in the charge or a change in the distance? Which one will have mathematically a larger impact on changing the force of attraction? The distance, why? Because it's squared. So when we look at, especially as you start looking at some of the periodic trends, you do need to keep that in mind somewhat that you know, sometimes we have to think about both charge and distance and what kind of impact do we have. Now why will charge, how are you going to look at charge when you look at the periodic table? Because if you stay within the same period on the periodic table, you're not really changing the, the distance much. There is, a, there is a decrease. I guess you should keep that in mind a little bit. But you are changing the number of protons. But if you're jumping energy levels, now we're going to see a much larger 
increase or decrease in that distance, which is going to play a role in the force of attraction. Now, I said the one thing when I started here today, I was talking about the, this is going to be important in looking at these periodic trends. And some of these things that, that you know, you know, different atoms have different number of energy levels, um, the fact that electrons repel. But I mentioned this thing called effective nuclear charge. And I didn't want to talk about it until we talked about Coulomb's law. So let's talk about just effective nuclear charge. So we, not in highlighter though. <laughs> effective nuclear charge so we understand what that means. When we talk about effective nuclear charge, what this is referring to is when there is shielding, of the nucleus by inner core electrons an outer electron may not feel the full pull of the nucleus So if we think about the calculation we just did, we looked at one electron and its attraction to all of the protons in the nucleus. But if we're talking about, I'm going to excuse my inner bore here, we're going to ignore the P's and the S's and the D's, but let's just think about energy levels for a moment. But if you're thinking about a very large atom and you're talking about an electron way out here, you know, maybe this has, I have no idea, I'm making this up, 37 protons in there. If you are computing the, the force of, of the attractive force on this electron and you do one electron and 37 protons, the reality is is that the effective nuclear charge is actually less than the real nuclear charge. So if you computed the real nuclear charge, which would be 37 protons times the charge of a proton, what this electron out here really feels is probably less than that because it has all of these inner electrons in here that are essentially shielding its ability to feel the pull of the nucleus. And so that's why it doesn't end up feeling the pull of all 37 electrons, but its, it's real pull is probably something less than 37 times the charge of the electrons. There's stuff in the way and they're negative things in the way, and so they're shielded by that. So when we talk about this term effective nuclear charge, that's what it's really referring to, and it does have to do with Coulomb's law. It has to do with the fact that if you calculate it, it's probably less than you would think if you actually calculated a number. Okay, I'm going to give you a worksheet that you will have a chance to start right now. I'm going to get rid of this. <laughs> 